and welcome to the Chicago Humanities Festival and today's program, Lynn Tillman in conversation with Eileen Miles. Eileen Miles' new book, For Now, offers an intimate glimpse into creativity's intimacy. With erudition and wit, Miles recounts their early years as an awakening writer, um, revealing the nature of writing as presence in time. My name is Clancy Dusa, and I'm the marketing director of the Seminary Co-op Bookstores. The co-op is two bookstores located on the south side of Chicago in Hyde Park. Our stores were founded in 1961, and in 2019, they became the first not-for-profit bookstores whose mission is book selling. This cultural mission work allows us to keep over 100,000 books on our shelves and work with like-minded cultural partners like the Chicago Humanities Festival to ensure events like these. You can learn more about these, event, these upcoming events at chicagohumanities.org and help support them by donating or becoming a member. Thanks to our captioner for making this event more accessible. All digital events have closed captioning and can be controlled through YouTube. You can learn more about accessible services at chicagohumanities.org slash access. This week's programs are presented with the support of Southwest Airlines. Please help me welcome Lynn Tillman and Eileen Miles. For Now is a, a really special book. It's, um, I read it in basically one gulp. Yay. But, and didn't, didn't want it to end, which as you know, is the mark of a good book. Uh -huh. uh, and I was very, very struck with how you wrote about this impossible subject, why I write, mm -hmm. because it is impossible. And you circle around it and the circle gets larger and then it gets smaller. And it's, it's kind of like an accordion, mm -hmm. uh, but the accordion of course needs breath, has this breath and it has also depth. So one of the first things I wanted to ask you about or talk to you about, because I'm trying not to be an interviewer, but a, a conversationalist, is this concept of copying. Mm. And that fascinated me uh, because the idea that writing is something that copies reality or co mm -hmm. copies fantasy uh, and that writing as a copy is always related to drawing, mm -hmm. which was an early love of yours. Mm -hmm. um, so I wondered if you could just talk a little bit more about this idea of copying rather than let's say originality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I think it's funny. I think the whole, the whole idea of copying actually came out of, um, being a writer who teaches writing sometimes because you're always I'm always flailing around trying to think of things to do with them and and I taught a lot of um, undergraduates over the years and in a way you just wanted to get people up and running in the act of writing and I think people have a tendency to get really internal you know and kind of talk about what they're worrying about or or have grand ideas about what writing is, what literature is. Mm -hmm. And so there's always, um, there's just always a lot of um, kind of fog, I think, in the, in, the, in the early practices of writers. And so one of the things that I had them do early on, I'm not even sure where I got the idea was to turn on a, um, turn on a bit of a film that I mean, any film is interesting, but I had a few particular films that I like to use. The Gollum, like an early silent film, and um, a cut from Linny, like a stripper, you know, and um, and then a piece from Chantal Ackerman um, with people coming and going from buildings. And I basically told them to look at this and just copy. Just say what you, you can't not impose any thoughts whatsoever Big, but of course you will, but but that you really are just simply dictating what what is appearing on the screen, and it doesn't have to be narrative. It can be anything that's um, going by, and so it can be that cat, it can be a shadow, it can be you know. But it's like you're just simply reporting, and it was so successful. And I started to realize to what extent writers like I think Kafka's America, a book that I love so much, it turns out came out of copying. He had never been to America. He just watched newsreels. And so if you looked, if you look at the book, it really has this literal quality of, of um, 
of, of, of being there and literally kind of copying an image as a way of, of reporting what something is or what's happening. Um, and so I, I, I think I start, you know, so in a way it was a retroactive practice. And I started to think that a lot of my own early ways of teaching myself to write, um, you know, I would go to workshops and they would give little assignments and then I would start to play and give myself assignments. And sometimes they would just be as dumb as open the refrigerator and just say what's in there, you know, making lists, making ornate lists, making, you know, and I, and I started to think because I do, I am like a art school wannabe that, that every exposure I had to very rudimentary practice in art school, there were, there were so often, um, it's not, it's not exactly conceptual, but there were so often just exercises that were practices of saying what's there. And I felt like writers don't really have much experience at that. We're supposed to kind of know what writing is already. And there's no studio where we kind of get our chops. And so I think by forcing myself and forcing people that I was trying to teach writing to, to like do something as basic as saying what's there, it just became a huge part of what I do and always do. And, and you know, as a writer too, I mean, I certainly, um, I use I and I use Eileen as a character a lot. And what I started to re realize the saving grace um, for myself, and this really leads into this book, was to have something else to look at and to talk about. And so I blah, 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 and then that tree outside the window and then lean on the tree. And, and also part of that was the experience of being an art writer and, and the editor of Art in America once saying to me, um, when in doubt, lean on the information. And I was, that was, what does that mean? And she was like, describe, you know? Right, and so right. I think it's, it's a very, core gift or a very core practice in writing but I started to and then I started to understand that in, a, in on so many levels that's what I was always doing I thought of the word uh, register you're you're in a sense you're registering what's outside you mm -hmm. and having students do that and recognizing that in a way writing is part of a kind of registration mm -hmm. of events and when I, I did do some uh, art classes, uh, two years of them or three years at Hunter College as my minor, mm -hmm. and doing a life drawing class was revelatory for me. Uh -huh. I, was the, I was the only non-art major in there. I'd never done anything like this. But having to draw an object or a body in front of you mm -hmm. forces you to look, to observe, in a way that I think is critically important. And I think all writers should be aware of that, um, that way of making art, of, mm -hmm. of really looking and seeing. And you, um, by copying, you move away from the idea of the original being um, the, the thing to be. And it reminds me of the idea that poets began by reading each other's poetry, mm -hmm. you know, and being very aware of that poetry. And that was part of the way you worked was by knowing earlier poets. And it, in painting, it's very different now. But if you look at an exhibition of um, a retrospective of Mondrian, his earliest paintings are still lifes or he gets from real so-called realism mm -hmm. to his, the work that we know him for, these geometric pieces. Mm -hmm. And so you, you use a phrase, and I just wanted to get to it, that I absolutely love. You say, you talk about the perversity of the original. And this comes along with a very interesting part of your book. Well, actually all the parts of your book are very interesting. Um, where early on when you began writing poems, you didn't want to keep, uh, you didn't want to make copies. Mm -hmm. And so it's funny that we're talking about copying but then in your own practice early on, you, you only wanted the or, original and you kept it in a little 
a, a trunk or a box. Uh -huh. And I wondered if you would talk about, I'm so interested in this idea that you didn't want to make a second copy of it. Of, of, of the famous, the milk crate and the yes. book? And the and and your and your um, owned early poetry where you it was just that one one poem and you didn't want to have a another copy of it for safekeeping say right well I think there was there was um, always this problem with writing and poetry that there was no thing I mean always often part of the reason it was explained to us or we explained to each other that we couldn't make money was that we had nothing to sell. We were just these beings it, sort of secreting these poems. And, um, you know, and there were many copies of them and many versions and many drafts. So it seemed like the very least I could do was to essentialize that. And, and also I think there was a sense of wanting to get something perfect. So once I got it right, I didn't want any of that process to be around. I just wanted this single pure poem. I mean, it was a very young way to feel about things, but I love, I love that the, there was a one, you know? And I think when it came to the the collection of stuff that was really, you know, was was kind of my first, I don't know if archive is right, but just certainly, a, um, um, you know, a real a real inventory of what I had done to that point. Um, I wanted to assert that I um, that I was that I was um, that I was on track. You know what I mean? Like I was kind of a messy kid you know I feel like I was all you know sort of living chaotically and sort of a little you know I I, I you know it's, I was both sort of on the edge and then not on the edge and I think I wanted to sort of say that I was very serious about my career you know and that almost somehow that 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 um that sense of that need to assert my seriousness meant that I have this archive, I have this single copy of what I have done and I know value and I would never lose this. I mean, it was just, it was, I mean, in retrospect, I mean, I'm not even sure it's so interesting. It's kind of insane, but I just felt like I just, in my desire to be kind of, um, you know, like when I was growing up, we had a, a big family next door and they always, you know, they always had dolls with heads off. I mean, it was just like very, punk rock and retrospect but it was so like my family prided ourselves it was a class it was a class thing kind of it being being very neat and very orderly and we you know I mean it wasn't true at all about who we were but there was this need to assert this simplicity of knowing what we had and that we would take care of our toys and we were good people and so I just you know I just thought who would need a copy of the most important thing you own I who would ever lose that you know um which is you know the irony of of you know part of the story of this book. I think uh, that that is a, a kind of demonstration or display of what I consider is tremendous innocence in this writing. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it is very touching. It is, um, maybe you have to get to a certain age. Maybe we have to get to a certain age not to have to defend ourselves. And I feel that what you've done in, in For Now, and there's a picture of For Now, <laughs> with a great picture of Eileen and a very characteristic gesture that she makes, that they make, sorry. Um, uh, now I went into another track thinking uh -huh. about yeah, yeah, yeah. But the innocence is, is so powerful. And I, I wanted to read just a, a short, way uh, uh, in which I see that. You, you write at one point, I think writing at best is always quickly darting off into what it does. Mm -hmm. The horizon of the practice, that out there. And even if the subject is me, it still feels that way. I'm gone necessarily. And I, I think that that says something about how a writer is in their work. Mm -hmm. How a writer, even when, and it's something hard to explain to people who are not writers sometimes, what it means to use yourself and not be in the work. Mm -hmm. 
And I wondered if you would talk about this concept of the horizon of the practice. It's a, a wonderful, wonderful term. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that it, um, it's very much an alive thing writing. You know, I think we all know it. I mean, I just that when you hear about when you hear about like baseball play, when I read about athletes, I'm always fascinated because they they know their own momentum, their timing, their unconscious. Um, they have all these little rituals. They have tricks. They're superstitious. And I think it's like, and I think, and I think of musicians as having that too. You know, like a kind of there's maybe there might even be more. Um, more um lore about you know like we know what miles said and we know you know and so on but i think but i think the thing it's so funny I mean, because we work in language we have that and yet i don't think we talk about it much it's it's and in a way it's virtually impossible because it it does come in these other nonverbal ways you know it's sort of like it's like when i when i i mean i and i do have athletic versions of you know and i think i mean though i've hardly ever water skied or skied or surfed. I, I know viscerally what the experience is of being on something that has a grade and you're, you know, sort of like there's something very bodily about writing because when you get a when you get a narrative going and suddenly that thing where you're you're almost gone, you're so deep in it, you know? And that's what you want. You want to be in the woods, you want to vanish. And it's kind of, you know, and it's very um you know, it's very solar even, you know, that it's sort of like, we know when you're going on a long hike or walk that it's sort of like the horizon keeps vanishing, you know, when you just, you're just heading into it. So I think it's, in a way, it's talking about the very intentionality of writing, which is this kind of lostness that you never entirely achieve, yeah. but it's sort of like, but at least being lost in the intention is, is, is kind of really getting there, you know, and I think we all kind of, um recognize that thing when it happens and even when other people talk about obliquely it obliquely in their own language i'm know. glad you brought up, <clears throat> brought up sports because i i actually do watch a lot of sports and really? uh, i'm particularly into tennis actually but uh, other sports as well and the way athletes think about themselves uh and know their limits now that's a question in writing always uh, or for the writer about their limits mm -hmm. and you know in in some ways I think each of us is trying to extend those limits to go past mm -hmm. what we had done once and the other thing about sports is, and I think this is attributable to writing too, when, and what you've been saying, when you are writing, your concentration, if, if you're in it, mm -hmm. if it's moving, if you're moving it, your concentration doesn't allow for any other, any other thing to come in. And you see this with great tennis players or that the, their concentration is only there and probably it's when they're at their happiest that, that they uh, can do that. I certainly am most happy mm -hmm. when, I, when I'm in the flow. Mm -hmm. But you know, what, what you're saying makes me think of this other thing, which is um, when you're warming up, you know? And I think we all have different um, aesthetics and practices around that, but it's sort of like, for me, I, I, I might know there's something coming or there's something I wanna do, but when I sit down, I might start talking about where I am, the room, what's going on. I don't know how much I'll use of it or if any, but there's a way in which you're sort of like, you're just revving, you know, you're just revving and you're just starting to, you know, like, um, just you're starting to kind of create a ground from which, from which to leave, from which to vanish, you know? And so the kind of that, that beginning part too, when, you may not even know what you're doing yet, or you might know where you want to go, but you know that you can't go like that. You've got to go, you know, and I'm really big for that of as being indirect as hell. And I can feel that in me. I mean, I think that like, as I change the, the way I do that, I mean, I'm not as, um, I'm not as swift as I used to be, or I'm not as, um, you know, I, I, you know, like it's just, it's, it's longer and slower. 
and I'm more distractible in a way too. And so it's, it's like actually quite scary to be working with this new instrument, which is my consciousness, which is my body, my age. And to realize that it's like, if I wiggle too much, I might, lose my flow you know it's like because the the flow is slower and different and it's sort of um more faceted than it used to be you know your flow your flow in for now is is just thrills me i have to say um and i was reading it now because you <clears throat> excuse me often don't use commas and there are ways in which your writing reminded me of Stein's prose. Um, and uh, there, it, there's some stuff that is rhythmically so similar. And I was really taken by that. And one of the things with the flow, you somehow can go from, from a, a thing about, let's say, writing into a family situation or into a girlfriend. Mm -hmm. or into the past, but the way it works and whether it's um, a, and a, a releasing of consciousness in a way, not holding back, mm -hmm. but the work is of course as associational, mm -hmm. very mm -hmm. associational. And I'm, I just found that there were kind of little miracles <laughs> in the way you handled that. and. Um, Sometimes the writing is anecdotal. Sometimes you're telling stories. Um, the writing is abstract. Writing mm -hmm. is always abstract, right? It's never- I believe, itself. yeah. And I, I wondered if you would go to page 72, uh, to the top paragraph. And if you would read that paragraph beginning like the moment. Huh. And I have to say, it's funny about this, what I'm describing here, strangely, must be the most significant thing that ever happened to me. Learning to ride a bike was really becoming something else as a human being, you know, like becoming vehicular. It's very weird, but I think it endlessly applies to all other kinds of learning, I think. Like the moment I was suddenly pedaling madly now was occurring in the writing of a book, which I think of as a network of smaller and bigger rotations, producing a realistic thing, a, a state, a place, something anonymous and still that actually becomes porous. And now other things, i.e. other texts and pictures can also migrate in and become citizens of the world of the book. These outer texts becoming inner produces a kind of bump like I referred to in sound recordings before. You can tell by the different fabric of this writing or assertion that it's definitely not from here, but that that difference makes here real. In a way, I think it's when writing becomes a political act. Now this is <laughs> such, such a dense yet flowing bunch of sentences, couple uh -huh. of sentences. And this notion of real and here Mm -hmm. and political act. I wonder if you just talk a little bit more about that, moving from peddling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, God, um, yeah, I mean, I guess, a, 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 I think just early on when I started writing and even before I started writing, my single goal was to become real, you know? I mean, I think it was an emotional um, desire. I think I came from a, a family that I think was very much weighted down by disappointment and you know you would know your father is somebody who wanted to be that and your mother wanted to be that and somehow they just didn't get on those roads and those things didn't happen and so there was this thing in the air that I wanted to get the hell away from and so I thought that that somehow my childlike judgment on them was that they were not real and I needed to become real and I had to decide that's fascinating they were not real <laughs> They yeah. didn't ever get to be real, you know? And what's weird, of course, is I think probably what was real was on television, what was in the movies, what was in books. These were real things. Do you, you think know? they did not seem real because you didn't believe that they believed themselves to be real? Yeah, I think they didn't. I think they felt like they were 
they had meant to get someplace. It was like there was a trip they were on and somehow or other they got waylaid and now <laughs> they were living with us. <laughs> so, the, so the peddling has even more meaning given that you wanted to be able to move in the way that, and go on a trip in a way they hadn't been. And this man gave me that agency. You know, I mean, I think I just, I did feel like I cited a couple of ways in which my father was so incredibly important to me. And, you know, there's all these other things, but literally the fact that the body that held the bike and ran next to you when you started mm -hmm. to understand what momentum felt like and what mm -hmm. balance felt like and when, and before you had it, and then when you had it and they were gone, and you were going, you know? Um, and so, um, I, yeah, I think I recall coming to New York. I remember going to poetry readings at St. Mark's and hearing Robert Creeley talk about being real. And um, I remember him talking about something that was, I can't even quote it now, but it was like, he was making some comparison between some state and the state of being a carpenter, like somebody who made things. And I think there was a real thing in the poetry world. I mean, it was part of the Buddhism of, of the practice that I slowly came to understand was really, you know, really, um, you know, mixed in with all the ways that I have been taught about writing that it was like, I think we were trying to earn the now we were trying to, to own it, claim it, work in it, um, be its, its servants. I guess know. that was part of the way in which the New York school wrote was about the now. I had, this is an odd question and maybe it's, but I suddenly thought about Ted Berrigan. Yes. And I know how important he was to you and you know I knew him a, a, a little bit. Yeah. Um, and I just wondered, and it sort of is tugging at my heart, how would he feel if he could read for now? Mm. Oh, I think, I mean, I think he's in there a lot in, in indirect and direct ways. I think, I, I, I think he would be proud of me. I think he would laugh at it in some ways and, but a teasing, loving, appreciative ways. He was a very, I think he was a very generous man. If you got it right, he, you know, he yeah. would let you know that that happened yeah. and you did that, uh, you know? Yeah. So he definitely was a receiver of moments so I guess you know I guess this whole practice of becoming real it just it, it had it, you know it's sort of like it's not unlike what, the way we're talking about writing it's sort of like finally you just had to make it up you know and it just became a series of rotations you know like when somebody told the story and it was fascinating how it held together how did they go from there to there to there to there and it just like it seemed like they would they would get to a point of excitement and they would know when to leap you know, yes. and yeah. I almost can only understand these things as having like a cycles meeting cycles meeting cycles so that you never stop moving. You right. always, you just jump onto something. It's sort of like trying to ford a river and it's sort of like suddenly what you're on is sinking and you were like, well, I can get onto that and you jump over there. Um, I remember years ago when we were at the Veselka, which was cafe or in uh, East Village where we often would meet, uh, this was before your selected had come out. It was about five years before. And you said, it's really important that my selected poems come out. Mm -hmm. Really, really important. And I didn't realize the extent to, to which, and you really wanted to, it to be published well. And it reminds me of your keeping only the original. <laughs> uh, and I didn't fully understand or even half understand what it would mean to have the selected come out. You write about it in For Now, uh -huh. how important it was. And it was, and as soon as it came out, things changed in your life, I uh -huh. think. And you were choosing, I guess with your editor, choosing which poems you thought best represented your work out of your entire era. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that experience, um, bringing out that book, from, from that moment on, your career, <laughs> such as one calls it a career, uh -huh. um, moved a lot, uh -huh. moved a lot. And that's so interesting to me because I, I'm not in the poetry world, I'm affiliated, let's say, with it. Uh, and certainly it's, poetry is very, is important to me. Um, 
but as a, as a novelist and short story writer, that kind of thing doesn't have the same impact. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe the collected stories of, you know, when Lydia, Lydia Davis's collected stories came out, I think that was very important. Mm -hmm. That's sort of outside the um, notion of why I write, but mm -hmm. it also speaks to how writing is communicated into the world. Mm -hmm. Um, I think your need to communicate, and that's what I feel reading uh, for, for now, is very strong, mm -hmm. very, very strong. And I, I just wondered what you or even I or other writers, that, that propulsion to communicate, mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's an unusual one. You mean, do you mean in all of us or in, I mean. In you, in you it's very, very, very strong. Um, and you, well, I, I'll, I'll quote something to you that you wrote that I just think is extraordinary if it's actually here. Um, uh, well, I don't know where it is. Uh, Jesus, it's about, the public about how your work becomes a building. Do you remember what page that's on? Oh, no. Um... I don't remember either. But what's interesting is that you wanted you wanted your poems to be like a building. And mm -hmm. then you say a public building, <laughs> not just a building. Uh -huh. And that once it's out there, anyone can walk into this building right and right right I, I thought i mean i read that and i was kind of stunned uh -huh. uh, by the idea that one's work is a bit is in some ways a building and i i understand that mm -hmm. i can see that and that anyone can walk into it <laughs> right I, I, I was you know how it is with certain lines it was fun to write that I thought yeah. that thought I was like yeah. oh, I can shed that thought and say that yes. and I think yes. that is true yes and I think it's sort of I mean, part of the thing you know the thing I was saying earlier about warming up and and you know like beginning to write like both in an occasion or over a long period of time and you're gathering and there's all these disparate pieces and it's like it's um you know it's precarious it's it's like you know you kind of you know there's a rep propulsion that I think makes us some of us continue and some of us cease you know and it's sort of like but you know you keep your nose to it and you keep going and stuff and yet there still is a sense in the same way that in a larger narrative that it's sort of like something has to gather up all the disparate fragments and then leap through that doorway or else you will stay in this room you know this is a book that's come out from Yale. Yeah. And you write about giving this lecture, the uh, Wyndon Campbell lecture yeah. at yeah. Yale, which is a very prestigious thing to do. And they've made a book of this lecture. And you say how it also is the context of this lecture is you're selling your archive to yeah. Yale. Right. And the way in which you talk about your archive and what that that means. And there's a whole there's a whole trope in your book about permanence and impermanence, mm -hmm. losing things, wanting to find something, having to let something go. <clears throat> and suddenly here's your work in an archive. Uh -huh. and you talk about it uh, that it's buried. And I I wondered how that affects your writing, thinking about that image of burial. Right. I mean, I think I'm just about passing through it. And I think one of the l really lucky things of this book, I mean, it was sort of, I, I, I don't even know how, how related it was that I was invited to give this talk and then the year or two before I had sold my archive. You know, I mean, these two facts were next to each other, but maybe not one read the other exactly. But um, but it was it was an opportunity, of course, to to state and shed the creepiness of this being kind of buried alive. Your your work, 
all your scraps, all your crap is somehow now saved. And now what do we do with this? You know, this kind of, this, this continuing body that writes notebooks and fills things. And, and, you know, and there was a lot of wariness of, of it. And I honestly, I feel like, and I really, you know, I, I gave the talk and then I was a little bit like, oh fuck, now I've got to give them the additional 13,000 words. And I definitely dragged the reader through this torture with me of, of having to complete the book. But the thing that was so wonderful for me emotionally was I realized that I was dealing with this pain of, of having probably lost this archive that was not the one that went to Yale, but the one that represented, I mean, those poems, the majority of them exist in some format, but it's like my own little archive is gone. I lost that. I lost my, you know, my my youthful the the innocence you talked that my innocent attempt to be safe. But the irony was now I am safe. So yeah. that 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 thing that it's almost like that little boat that I made to get to here sunk. But now I'm here, and I just I started to realize that that part of what I got to let go of now is that the proof doesn't need to exist anymore. I want to read you something you wrote about this archive. Before I sold anything, I already started to feel the creeping value of the past. Mm -hmm. I just, creeping value of the past is <laughs> so super great. And the new place the past was playing in the present. Intuitively, I had always known to save things, but temperamentally I am the opposite and felt compelled to create a radiant whole. And this idea of a radiant whole um, appears a couple of times in, in the text. And that sense that if you keep it temporary, mm -hmm. if you don't stabilize everything, if it's you say it's not going to be uh, uh, held together somewhere. Uh -huh. This radiant whole, uh, it's, a, it's a kind of almost religious image. Yes. Right. I wondered if you'd talk about that a little. I mean, I suppose, I mean, I could, you, any piece of paper could be, you know, obviously punched through and it's sort of like, and depending where you put it, the light can come through. So I think there's a, there's a sense that it's an escape hatch, but at what point does it just become a piece of wreckage and something that's lying on the street and nobody, not even you knows what it is. So I think, I think there was a sense of like, you know, porousness and, and um, everything where the opening at the end of the cave and the end of the tunnel. And it's just like that, that, that there is, you know, it's, and I think when you, again, when you're leaping around and writing and getting to the next place, it's sort of like that thing is part of what empowers you, you know, that sort of, I think there's an order of light that we kind of travel through. It's so or, or oxymoronic, radiant whole. And yes, yes, it yes. is. And, and, and there is something in your work that uses uh, oxymorons in a very exciting way. And the word radiant always made me, makes me think of Keith Haring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And of course, and, and of course it just, you know, it, it adheres to him still now that he's gone and it, it's, it, it, and it preceded that so that it was almost like he was making his own way while he was still with us. Yes, um, I wondered, um, I think we're gonna have to end soon. I'm not sure, but I wondered, I wondered if, there were some other things you wanted to say about for now. For, for instance, I'm very curious, of course, now I'm leading question. Yeah. About, you know, you write in many different places. You talk about, I, I realized how place is very important to you. Yeah. Very important to you and the, keeping your apartment or not and what home is. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if you wanted to talk about place in your poems place as a psychological issue for mm -hmm. you? I mean, this, this, this book was, again, a lucky, um, well, I don't know if that's the way I want that sentence to fall, but I mean, the, the, the challenge of this lecture and this 
commission was to talk about how I write that was so weighty and so kind of like, oh, you know, how can I talk about that? But the, the, the beautiful um, accident, which was that at that time, my landlord was trying to take my home away from me, which is such a desperate and literal struggle. And so um, it's just like having that as an object that I could flee to gave me a way to talk more abstractly about things that I felt awkward about, you know, like this practice that we're talking about and how do we ever talk about this practice? But mm. the fact that there was a, a literal there, there, you know, it's like we all know that famous line of Gertrude Stein's, there was no, no there, there. And mm. no matter what I think about my apartment, there is a there, is a there, there. <laughs> you know, it's sort of like, it's such a there, you know, it's sort of like, it seems to be something that grew out of my body because I've spent so much of my life here. And so it's funny that I just, I often even come into this space very excited because I know what, you know, like I'm just finishing an essay about Moira Davy and Peter Hujar, you know, and it's like, oh, how, how great. There they are pinned to the wall. I mean, I start, I decided to install them in my building. I printed out the whole fucking show. I put it out in the halls. I just Where tried- Where is to, the show? It's, well, it was in Berlin in February. And weirdly, I think it was a bit of a, um, a victim of the pandemic because it was up for a couple of weeks and then it had to close. And I think it did open later on, but it was like, it was slightly abstracted. And then there was the, you know, there's the, the living woman and the dead man. And so it's just interesting. But, but all I, I mentioned it only to say that having, I think, finished it pretty much, I'm dying to get the hell out of here. You know, it's almost like I need to, I mean, I know what I'm working on next and I need to get my body out of the space. My, you know, Aaron lives in Long, Long Island, so I'm going to get in my car and drive to Long Island tomorrow. And I know that I'll be happy there for five days and then I'll be like, I got to get to the city. I need to do blah, you know. So I think our little shells um, kind of make things possible and then make things impossible, you know. And I think so much, you know, Texas is so perfect for me because it has nothing to do with me, you know. It just... <laughs> It's not my landscape. It's not New York. It's not the East Coast. It's as other as you could get. And so it just feels so open. Do you always place. know what you're going to do next, Eileen? Well, you often there's something pressing. I mean, I'm doing an anthology called Pathetic Literature, which your end, though, I haven't asked you yet. Um, <laughs> well, but, I identify pathetic indeed. <laughs> yeah, I think everything that I love is pathetic. Um, and, you know, it's it's all in a novel that I'll be getting, you know, once I get pathetic literature out of the way, I return to the novel. But but as we know, and things come up, people ask us to do things, we need to make money, or things are appealing. And then for me, poetry just kind of just litters the landscape beautifully. Like. Well, it's the way you think. I mm -hmm. think it's the way you think. I think one of the ways in which I really... Um, respond to your work is that this is a form this is this poem is is thinking this is a thinking poem yeah yeah it illustrates the fact that in fact i am thinking <laughs> yes. yes well and many people aren't including our you know infector in chief right now wow, wow. I mean, how can we oh, i mean a person who gets on a balcony i mean Mussolini, i'm glad they said mussolini He's so, he gets up on the balcony and he takes off his mask. What are you? Yeah. He's uh, not from any planet I uh, <laughs> ever want to recognize. No, and love that New York just kind of pushed him out. Yes. You know, he's yeah. not ours in any way. No, no, he's <laughs> not. Is there anything else that you want to? Um, no, no, no. I just, I really, I'm just so grateful to have had, I mean, we haven't seen each other for a while and it's just oh, like, no. I thought well, I'm in a cafe with Lynn, even though, are you in Hudson? I'm in Hudson and you're on East Third Street. I am right now. Yeah. And so it's just, thank you so much for this generous visit and, and you guys in Chicago, we love you. And I love seeing um, you grow up. And it's just such a pleasure for me to talk to you. And now I'm going to want more, Eileen, more talk. <laughs> yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Okay. No.